All right, let's go ahead and release the young people to their classes. Thank you, Jesus. I should say the children, for those of you that think you're so young. Praise God. Well, we've been ministering now for seven weeks. This will be the eighth week on this uh, series I've entitled Rooted in Love. And I just kind of like to see a show of hands of anybody that's feeling more love now than they were seven weeks ago. Anybody experiencing more of God's love in, in, in your life now than you were seven weeks ago, eight weeks ago? More confident of it. That's what I'm talking about. You know, experiencing it means you're more confident of it because it's there anyway. Isn't that right? So we've been teaching based on, we started with uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, but we've really been teaching based on what John had to say in his, his, uh, his epistle when he said that we have come to know and believe in the love that God has for us. And it is so, so true. In all my 40-some years of ministry here, 40, close to 40 years of ministry, I've become aware of one thing more profoundly than anything else, that, that the body of Christ has really struggled believing in God's love for them. And if the body of Christ struggles believing in God's love for them, how much more is the world going to be out of touch with the revelation of God's love for all men? For God so loved the world. He didn't for God so loved the church. Right? There was no church when for God so loved the world. Isn't that right? So, you know, that, that, that really has uh, troubled me that so few believers actually embrace the concept and believe in God's love for them. Because that's the whole core of the gospel. That's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is not about your behavior. The gospel is not about God cleaning you up or making you, uh, you know, uh, more, more uh, what do I want to say, more uh, uh, eligible for a what would Jesus do bracelet. You know, or anything like that. That's not what the gospel is about. The gospel is about you coming to know and believe in the Father's love for you as evidenced in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that a little bit more today. If you turn with me, first of all, to uh, the 10th chapter of Romans. And I've entitled today's message, Whoever Believes on Him. But I can tell you right now, it, it's not going to be what you would expect from, that, from a message uh, in, entitled with that. Romans chapter 10. We're going to read verses 18, or 8, I mean, through 17. Probably a very familiar passage of scripture to most of you. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the, from the dead, you will be saved. Remember that word saved doesn't mean born again. That word saved means healed, delivered, rescued, preserved. It's a different word. It's not the same word. People confuse the word. It's been part of the problem we've had. See? Paul's talking to the church here. Paul's talking about, about the application of grace in their lives, the experience of grace in their lives. He said, if you believe in your heart and agree with that, you declare your agreement with your mouth, you're going to experience that which Jesus has already provided. See, in every aspect. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed, or that word means believed, the gospel. For, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. See, there's confirmation that that word obeyed means believed. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, we're going to deal with this entire passage of Scripture to some degree. But anyway, going back to verse 10, if you read verse 10, it tells you, it, it makes it clear that what we believe or what we're persuaded of in our hearts ultimately determines the experience of our lives. Now, I want to make sure you understand something. I'm not saying that your believing creates the experience because Jesus has created the reality. Jesus has made uh, all things available to you. All things pertaining to life and godliness have been made available to you because of what the Lord Jesus has done. Is that right? So you don't create it with your believing. Believing does not make things happen. Confessing does not make things happen. But beginning to talk about what you believe will allow you to enter into the experience of Jesus. Because you see, he's already experienced it in you, as you, for you. Is that right? 
All that has been done has been done by the experience of Jesus. And you were died, died with him, buried with him, raised with him, made alive with him, and seated with him. Isn't that right? All right, so it says here that, uh, that what we believe or what we're persuaded of in our heart really is ultimately responsible for the experience of our lives. Now, believing the right message or believing the truth, okay, really, that, that simply allows what God believes about me to become my expectation. In other words, we're talking about embracing God's belief. When we talk about believing in our heart, believing the truth, we're talking about allowing what God already believes to be true about you because of what His Son has done to become your expectation. So in other words, we're not creating anything with our believing. We're simply agreeing with what has already taken place. Does that make sense to you? And this word confession that's used here is a word that just means we declare our agreement. And so when we declare our agreement with what God believes to be true because of what Jesus has done, when we declare our agreement, then that is our participation in the experience of Jesus. I want you to get that. There is nothing for you to experience but what Jesus has already experienced. Your experience will become the experience that, that he has already created for you when you begin to verbalize or declare your agreement. That's all the word confession means. You know, some of us got locked up in some, in some teaching in, in, a, in, a way of, in a way of delivery that made us think that, that if we would believe something and then if we would declare it, we would produce it, that we would cause it to be. But Jesus caused it to be. By the will of the Father who works all things according to the counsel of His will, not according to the counsel of your confession, not according to the counsel of what you believe. Your belief is, is, is allowing, simply allowing what He believes to become your expectation. I hope that's clear to you. And your declared agreement or your confession then uh, is, I should say, is your participation in the experience of Jesus. Now, he goes on in verse 11, and I want you to look at this. He says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, or some versions say dis disgraced. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame or disgraced. And you look it up, you find out that they both mean the same thing, uh, basically, or that shame is defined for us as disgrace. But what is disgrace? Disgrace means to be neutralized in the experience of grace, doesn't it? said, whoever believes on him will not be neutralized in their experience of grace. Whoever believes on him. There's an experience of grace out there available to all men everywhere. For the grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation to all men. There's an experience of grace out there waiting to be enjoyed and participated in by all humanity. Isn't that right? To be disgraced means to be neutralized in the experience. Whoever believes on him, he says, will not be disgraced or will not be neutralized in the experience of grace. Or he says it this way. He uses, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, I want to put some emphasis on some different words for a little while and maybe clear up some of the things that you've, uh, that you've had to deal with in your own wonderments. We have all have some wonderments, don't we? Okay. We, look at this. It says, whoever believes on him, put him in red letters if you can in your, own th in your own thinking for a minute. Whoever believes in him, on him, will not be put to shame. But let me ask you this real quick. What if they believe on a golden calf, assuming it's him? Now, wait a minute. Let's go back over to, I'm coming right back here, but let's go over to Exodus 32.4 for just a minute. Because uh, you might think, see, we're so proud of, our, of the absence of idolatry in our Christian thinking. And yet what I'm going to be talking to you about today, I think, will, uh, will impress you once again with the idea that maybe we still do have a, uh, uh, a, a subversive idolatry in the way we think and the way we believe. Uh, Exodus 32.4. And he received, speaking of Aaron, he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, and this is what they said. This is, you know, the church of their day, if you will. Okay. They said, referring to this golden calf, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. They didn't just say, this is a God that we're now going to worship in the absence of a, of, a, of a communicating God. This is the God who brought you out of the land of, Israel, of, of Egypt. See, they're giving this God credit for something that, that the true God did, right? 
So my question is this, okay? Because it says, whoever, you can go back to Romans now. Whoever believes on him will not be ashamed, right? Will not be put to shame. My question is then, but what if they're believing on a golden calf? <laughs> you see, assuming it's him. Is that going to do them any good? No, it's not going to do them any good, is it, right? So what if they're believing in someone that he's not? What if you're believing today in someone that he's not? Think about it, right? Now, Paul says, whoever believes on him. When Paul says, whoever believes on him, Paul's not confused about who him is. Paul's not confused about who him is. Paul is referring to who he really is. Paul knows the him that he has in mind when he says whoever believes on him. Isn't that right? He said, I'm not referring to a God of your imagination or a God of your devising. I'm not referring to a God of, 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 uh, of humanly ascribed attributes and characteristics. And yet in this room, as we've talked about over the last several weeks, probably at least up until recently, there have been a variety of humanly aspired, I mean ascribed uh, attributes and characteristics of God that have been previously regarded in your lives as the first premise, the primary truth you know, of God, the first principle. Most of us started somewhere else. Oh, God is sovereign. And love then is defined by sovereignty because sovereignty is the first principle or the primary truth or the, or the basic premise of who God is. But you see, everything, every one of us has had that. Holiness being the first premise, you know, righteousness, justice, sovereignty, omnipotence, omniscience, whatever. Somewhere along the line, we've all probably had the idea of a false first premise. And we have allowed love, among other things, then, to derive its meaning from that first premise. Isn't that right? That first principle. But we have discovered what? That the first principle, the primary truth from which all other truths of God receive their definition and therefore their validity is God is love. And everything must be defined by love, not love defined by anything else. And yet most of us have had love defined by something else so much that we believe in a golden calf and we think it's God. We call it God. Now, the truth is, he says here that whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And I can tell you right now that shame has a, has a, gra a grasp on many of you in this room. And really, what is shame? Shame is sin consciousness. So let's don't just look at shame in the idea, in the, uh, from the perspective of shame on you for the ugly thing you did. Remember, sin consciousness has as much to do with your pride in your successes as it does in your, your uh, dissatisfaction in your failures. Sin is missing the mark. And when you begin to believe that you, that you gain favor with God or that you have a greater degree of acceptability, worthiness, or usableness because of things you've done, that's sin consciousness. That's being conscious of your attainments and thinking that they somehow or another influence your relationship, your fellowship, and your, well, your usability with God, right? So sin consciousness goes from one extreme to the other. It's anything that focuses on you and your works, good, bad, or indifferent, okay? Well, shame is really the same type of a principle. Shame, see, is, is, has, has that same broad concept. So he's saying that whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And I'm going to say to you, with all, with all the confidence in the world, because I've been a pastor for nearly 40 years, and because I've also been a human being for 67 years, who's done exa had exactly the same kind of things going on in me that you've had going on in you, shame has a tight grip on many of you in this room And therefore, you are being neutralized in the experience of grace, and you're asking why. What's going wrong? What am I doing? What am I not doing? And that, that right there is a, a, an indicator. What am I doing? What am I not doing? Well, there you go. There's that sin consciousness. You see, that's an expression of shame having, having grabbed you around the throat and is choking the life out of you. Amen. Thank you. I thought there was more than one person here today, but praise God. <laughs> See, but here's the thing: could it believe? Could it be that you're believing on someone you only thought was him? Could it believe that you're believing on some? Could it be that you're believing on someone you only thought was him? Now remember, we've said this over and over recently. I mean, I got this particular phrasing from Andre Rabin when he was here. But I'm here to question your answers, not to answer your questions. 
I mean, I've been telling you that for years, that I'm here to create questions in you, but I like it put that way because you and I all have a series of answers that are already written down in our, in our thinking, in our memory, you know, and ready to be expounded upon when anybody confronts us with that particular question, see, that goes with that answer. We match it up. We run through the files real quick. Oh, there's that answer. I put that away a long time ago. I've never bothered to revisit it because I know I'm right. See? So we're, remember, we're here questioning your answers. We're questioning my answers and so on. So could it be that you're believing in someone you only thought was him? Because, see, it's very clear, folks, that if it's him, in red letters, <laughs> that you're believing on, there, there won't be any shame in your life. Not even, I mean, you know, you're saying, but, but what about when I fail? No, not even when you fail. There won't be any because, you know, though you failed, he succeeded in your behalf as you, for you, long ago. So you're already a success. You can't be anything but a success because God has already ordained you a success in Jesus. <laughs> he has already fulfilled the law for you, in you, through you, in Jesus. For what the law could not do, weak as it was... See, God did, sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in those of us who walk by the Spirit and not by the... In other words, that we might recognize that the righteous requirement of the law has all been, already been fulfilled by him acting as us. Not that we might become proficient in keeping the Ten Commandments now that he has done. No, that's not what that means at all in Romans 8, 2, and 3. It means so that we might understand that that law has already been fulfilled. There is no law to perform of performance anymore that stands between me and God. See what I'm saying? So he's already fulfilled all your success. You can't be any more successful than you already are. But what you can do is begin to declare your agreement and enter in, begin to participate in the experience of Jesus that was your experience before you were ever born. Been there, done that. Get my book. Listen to the series. I'll tell you. Anyway. <clears throat> all right. So anyway. So, so who... Must we believe on? Because he said, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So who must we believe on then? If I'm saying it's possible that you're believing on someone you only thought he was. All right. Look at verses 12 and 13. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So first of all, it says the Lord. So that gives us our first our first uh, suggestion here, I said, who are we supposed to believe on? Well, he says the Lord here. Now, so notice what he said. He said, the Lord is rich, and that word means to be affluent or abundant in resources. The Lord is rich to all who call upon him. Now, I'm just going to keep playing with some words until you get it today. The Lord <laughs> is affluent in resources upon all who call upon him. Right? Let that sink in a little bit. Now, it says call upon. Now, what do we think a call upon means? It says call upon means cry out to to us. That's what we think it means, cry out to. Any of you ever cried out to the Lord and not felt like you got an answer? Yeah, really? Is that, is, has that happened to any of you besides me? See, because, because call upon has never been properly presented to us. And so we think it just means, you know, the Lord in heaven... We will acknowledge there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, so on and so forth. So, so we will say there is a Lord in heaven, one Lord, and, and I'm going, I have called on that Lord, I have cried out to that Lord, and I have seen little or no response at times in my life. I wonder why that might be. Well, part of it is because this word doesn't really mean to cry out to. Here's what it means. It means to be named after someone to permit oneself to be surnamed. Now listen to this. In other words, what he's saying is that the affluence of his resources is both discovered and experienced in our true surname. Okay, we're going to build on this. But, it, but this word means to permit oneself to be surnamed. It means to be named after someone, but to permit oneself to be surnamed. Now, you've heard me tell before that I had one son who decided at one time in his life that he was no longer my son, I was no longer his father. 
He was not permitting his surname to have influence on his life for a short period of time. Now, of course, he couldn't change the relationship. The DNA was fixed. Isn't that right? But he was not permit, And he was surnamed, but he wasn't permitting himself to, to, to uh, I won't say enjoy, because I don't know if at that time if there were a lot of benefits to... to <laughs> but he wasn't participating in the value of surname. Of his surname. So he lived away from the family. He lived away from mother's cooking. He lived away from clean clothes. He lived away from a warm house. He lived away from a lot of things that he could have been experiencing simply by allowing himself to acknowledge his surname, so to speak, right? So that's what this word means. And what we haven't realized here is that we permit ourselves to be surnamed or or we take upon ourselves the identity of the him we know. You get that? See, I, I tell you again, in this room, maybe not so much now, but over the past several years, there have been many hymns, not H-Y-M-N-S, okay, many hymns represented in the belief system of the people who were certainly, you know, his children. But many hymns that have been recognized. <clears throat> So verse 13 says this, whoever permits himself to be surnamed with the name of the Lord will be saved, healed, delivered, rescued. Whoever permits himself or whoever takes upon himself or acknowledges the identity of his true surname will be saved. Now look at this, 13th verse, who's the promise for? Whoever, right? Whoever, then, then why have so many called upon the name of the Lord or, you know, cried out to the name of the Lord with so little benefit? Well, Paul's quoting Joel 3, 3, uh, 2.32. So I want you to go over to Joel with me. First one there, give me a page number, would you? Make matters worse, I have to come back to Nahum later on, and I'm sure I'll never find it. I just found it. I won't find it then. There's Joel. Joel 2.32. Okay, Joel says, and Paul quotes it, and it shall come to pass. So what's Joel doing? Joel is looking forward to the new covenant in Jesus Christ. He's, He's speaking forward in time. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So there it is. That's what Paul's talking about. Now, the reason I brought you here is for two reasons. Number one, I want you to see here, and of course, Paul did quote it this way, but I want you to see here that Joel did not say, whoever calls on the name of, uh, on a name of a Lord, right? Or he didn't even say of a name of the Lord, which is the most common problem in the church. Calling on a name of the Lord, expecting some kind of response. I get this. It's important to get. See, Joel was clear on both counts. He said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Getting it? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved or shall, shall uh, you know, uh, experience all of grace, right? So I'm going to suggest that the problem lies in the name we're calling on. I'm going to suggest that the problem lies in the name we're identifying with, that the surname, okay, and that the Lord we've devised has surnamed us. See, we have we have allowed ourselves. Remember, this word means allowed yourself to be permitted. I mean, permitted yourself to be. So I'm going to tell you that the that the Lord that we have believed in has indeed we've permitted that surname to become our name. Now, as I've told you before, you know, I knew a pastor, no, a pastor in this town who years ago, you know, his, his, his basic premise, his first principle of the oracles of God was that God is sovereign. And because God is sovereign, then if God should desire, he spoke these words over our dinner table in our home, the first year he was here starting his church, if God should desire to take one or both of my children, then that is his sovereign right to do so. And I looked at him across the table and I said, my dear, my God, man, I mean, I, didn't give, I, I won't use his name. I looked, I said, my God, man, I said, you are so out of touch with the, with the true nature of God. I will never say a thing like that because I know, number one, God is love. God would never take my children from me. See what I'm saying? And so here's a guy who has a God who has surnamed him 
or he has permitted himself to be surnamed son of the sovereign God. See what I mean? Son of the holy God. Son of the just God. See, we do that. We take on, we permit ourselves to be surnamed by the God we believe in. By the him we believe in. And the him we believe in becomes the experience of our life. And you can find this, if you, I think it's Matthew 18, I can't remember the chapter, but, you know, in the parable of the talents. And this one man who has known his master to be a hard man. And so he was surnamed in a sense. He, took, he permitted himself to be surnamed or to, for his experience to be dictated to by his perception of the master. The other two didn't see him as a hard man. And they received the benefit and the blessing of what the, uh, that the, uh, the uh, landowner intended for them to receive. And more besides, it says. One was, one was given the, the other fellow's stuff even. See what I'm saying? It's because one man allowed himself or permitted himself to be surnamed by a God that was not him. So we take it on. Oh, I'm the son of a sovereign God. I'm the son of a just God. I'm the son of a righteous God. I'm the son of a holy God. I'm the son of an omnipotent God. I'm the son of an omniscient God. How about I'm the son of a father who loves me beyond my ability to comprehend? How about I'm the son of a father who has loved me with an everlasting love and has poured his entire resources? He is affluent in resources towards me because of his great love. How about that? How about that becoming my, you know, my, my comprehension of, my na- of who he is that I'm calling upon, right? All right, so, <clears throat> so as I said, maybe we're calling on names he can't answer to. Ever been out in the parking lot and heard somebody yelling, and, you know, yelling a name and you, you kind of hear it, but, you know. If I was walking across the parking lot down here by Macy's and somebody else started yelling, Fred! Hey, Fred! I'm not going to turn around and say, huh? Now, I know that God's a little bit bigger than that. That's a pretty poor analogy. But the point is, we may be calling on names that he can't respond to. God's a God of integrity. God's not going to say, okay, I know you're calling on me and I know that you have allowed yourself to become known as the son of a sovereign God. But that's not the way I've revealed myself. I haven't revealed myself. I've revealed myself in love, through love. See what I'm saying? So it's not not that God can't take my analogies and and squash them in the dirt. I'm not telling you that at all. But I just want you to kind of get an idea today because I really believe this is true. I hear this. I've talked to people before and I've said this here before. I can can talk to somebody generally, talk to them face to face for 30 to 45 minutes and I can tell you where their their issues are. I mean, if I ask the right questions, if if I'm of a mind to ask the right questions, I can find out right away where their problems are. See? Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to just barf them on them. But I recognize them many times. And it works the same with me between my wife and I. We, we understand one another. She's constantly reminding me who I really am, you know. And I don't mean jerk or any of those words. I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the, the true things, you know. We need that kind of thing once in a while. But anyway, so, so here's Joel. He's, uh, he's referring to the new covenant in Jesus. And you need to realize that his understanding is rooted in the name of the Lord that God himself gave as the revelation of his glory. Remember, Jesus is the brightness of his glory. And so we went last week, and let's back over there real quick to Exodus 33. Because this is the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord that Joel is referring to when he prophesies of the New Testament, the day that co- day is coming when they shall call on the name of the Lord and they shall be saved. Because there's only one name. There's only one name, and I'm not saying, don't jump ahead of me and say, oh, I know, that's the name of Jesus. Yeah, but even the name of Jesus has not been properly defined in many of your hearts. In many of your hearts, Jesus is, yes, the the first begotten, only begotten Son of God. Yes, Jesus is is the Son of God. I mean, you, you can give me all kind of definition about Jesus, but even in Jesus, many times, you have not been able to vocalize the name from any kind of a heart concept that embraces this name of the Lord that always causes grace to be effective in our lives. I guess we need to have another conference to get people excited again. 
Exodus 33, 19. Like I said, we were here last week, so I just remember that in, well, in verse 18, Moses said, Please show me your glory. What's glory? According to vines, the nature and acts of God in self-manifestation, the view and the opinion of God, which is reality. Okay? Remember, your view and opinion is not reality. God's view and opinion is reality, right? The way God sees things is the right way to see them. The way you and I see the things, unless we're seeing God's way, is going to be distorted every time. And glory is also the nature and the acts of God in self-manifestation. And so we find in Hebrews 1, 3 that Jesus is the brightness or the revealing or the revelation of his view and opinion, his nature and acts in self-manifestation. Moses says, show me your glory. And God responds with, okay, I will, verse 19, I will make all my goodness pass before you. So we already have a revelation here, a quotation by God himself of his nature and acts in self-manifestation. The psalmist said, you are good, you do good. God is good. Good is an old covenant synonymous term, basically, with God is love. I'm not saying the words are synonymous, but you get what I'm saying. We find more, a lot of expressions of God is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You see, we see that a lot in the Old Testament, that kind of terminology. All right, so he said, then I will make my goodness pass before you. Now go over to chapter 34. And we're going to look at just verses 5 through 7. Now, this is the next day. He, this is what he promised Moses he was going to do when he asked you, show me your glory. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Now, wait a minute. He passed before him. He proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now, remember what Joel said. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? He didn't say a name of the Lord. He didn't say the name of a Lord or a name of a Lord, did he? He said the name of the Lord. I mean, it's important we get this because we've mixed it all up and we have different ways that we that we do that. We respond with an A and a V from different in the wrong places sometimes in our own thinking. See? All right. So in verse five, he says, now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Right now, I want you to remember, this is the name <laughs> The name of the Lord that's associated with his glory or with his goodness. This is not the name of the Lord that we have associated with the giving of the law or with the fall of man or with man's sin. Those names are names like just and righteous and holy and sovereign. Those words. See, those are the names that we have given God based on man's problems, on the fall of man, on sin and on the law. We've assigned names. We have given humanly ascribed attributes to God. Now, I'm not saying God's not holy. Remember, this is all based on the fact that there are many truths about God, but they receive their validity, their expressive validity in being defined by love, not being defined by one another within some closed group there. You see what I'm saying? Yes, God is holy. Yes, God is righteous. Yes, God is just. And thank God, because love, for instance, defines justice, we find out that God took care of, resolved all justice in Jesus Christ on the cross for all of humanity through the one act of righteousness that resulted justice, justification of life for all men, right? And that was because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that if I be lifted up, I will draw all judgment unto me. You see what I'm saying? So now judgment, justice, righteousness, holiness becomes defined by the love of God rather than vice versa. And yes, God is all those things. He's definitely all those things. But we've given him names based on our perspective of what's really important. What's, what's important? Well, obviously the fall and, and man's sin and, and man keeping the law and man not doing this and man not doing that. Those are the important things. And we need to realize from the pulpit, I say all the time, not me, but I mean the, the preacher must say, uh, you know, you need to realize that God is a God of justice. Getting it? Okay. So as I said, remember that this name that he's about to proclaim to us is the name of the Lord that Joel was referring to, but it's the name that's associated with his glory, Jesus, the brightness of his glory. It's the name that's associated with Jesus, okay? So this is the identity of the Lord, and this is the name that we are to what? Call upon. 
This is the name that we are to call upon. This is the name that reveals His glory, (laughs) and it also reveals our true surname. Okay, so let's read this name. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands of generations. Remember I told you, Deuteronomy 7, 9 defines that thousands better for us. It's, It's intended to say thousands of generations, not just thousands of people. That wouldn't have even gotten him halfway through the the, the group he had before him right then. Right? Keeping mercy for thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sins. And then what does that next tell you say if you were here last week? That word lo in the Hebrew, L-O, pronounced or translated just no here. It means what? By no other, no other means. By no other means clearing the guilty. Not by no means clearing the guilty. That doesn't even make sense with what he just said. It doesn't even fit in. It's a completely asinine statement to say it that way. And yet we've got doctrines of of generational curses and things like that that came out of that. But no, the word means or else. You can look it up. Or else and no other. So God said, by no other means clearing the guilty or else the iniquities of the fathers will return upon the children. But he has just said, this is my name. This is what I do. See, I have compassion upon whom I have compassion. Right? I'm gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And he's saying to whomever. Not to just a few select. I'm gracious to all of humanity. I make my rain to fall, my sun to shine on the just, the unjust by your designation. The righteous, the unrighteous by your designation. See? But you need to realize... He's given us his name here. This is our true surname. This is the name that relates us to the Father in Jesus Christ. This is the name that is condensed in the name Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus Christ means. So when you're going to call upon the name of the Lord, this is what you must understand about who you're calling upon. The hymn you're speaking to, the hymn you are identifying with, the surname that you are permitting yourself to be surnamed with. I'll read it to you again. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. Wow. And by no other means, clearing the guilty. Or else. See? God knew that sin, you know, is going to continue to perpetuate itself unless he did something about it. So Jesus came and put away sin once for all by the sacrifice of himself. That's what he's telling us right here, by no other means. Uh, Or else, it'll just continue to perpetuate itself, right? I'll take care of that, he said. I can handle it. You can't. Boy, I wish I'd had the week you all have had, man. I wouldn't be any more excited than you. (laughs) So this is the name that's intended to be be understood and is condensed in the name of Jesus Christ. So when Paul says this, so when Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ liveth within me, you must understand that Christ, or that that Paul had a comprehension of the name he was speaking. It's no longer I who live, but it's merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth and mercy, forgiveness of transgression, iniquity and sin. That's the name. No longer I who live, but that's who lives within me now, right? Isn't that awesome? Okay. But here's the thing. The name that we call upon or cry out to, the name that we identify ourselves with, isn't always reflected in the word that comes out of our mouth. Like I said a while ago, we all talk about Jesus, and yet sometimes we don't have even a comprehension of Jesus, and much less a clear and accurate comprehension of God or Father even. See what I'm saying? But the name that we're calling upon actually is reflected by, by who we believe in our heart we're calling upon. Isn't that right? Because we can all use the same language. We can all use the same wording. And yet in our wording, we have many different ideas that are being expressed by that singular word. And I'm sorry to say there's only one name that is correct for us to be able to embrace and, and, and to allow that name to become our operative surname, our experiential surname, that which we really believe in to be my last name, if you will, right? Say, if your name is Jones and you're standing at my front porch, you know, <laughs> ex- expecting... This will sound funny to you if you know me, okay? <laughs> if you're standing on my front porch expecting the affluence of my resources <laughs> to be at your disposal... Now think about this, okay? 
In case you're new here, my name's Miller, not Jones. Okay. If your name is Jones and you're standing on my front porch expecting the abundance of my, inf- of my resources to be at your consistent and constant disposal, if you're there because you believe it's your right, in other words, you know. Now, I may, because I'm a fairly kind guy, I may bring you in and feed you a meal. I may give you a C note. Chances of that are really slim. I, I, may, even, I may even take you where you need to go. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not excluding God being merciful and gracious and kind to somebody who doesn't really understand who he is. Obviously, we've all had those experiences. You see? But as we grow up, we need to begin to identify with our family. So if you want a consistent, you know, uh, resource, you know, it'd be better for you to go down to the Jones house than to stand out in front of the Miller's house. Isn't that right? It would be better for you to go identify with the, the, they who have the legal, I'm not, I'm not bringing legality into God, but I'm just saying they who have the actual legal, you know, estate that you can be resourced from. Does that make sense to you? I mean, again, that's a weak, any analogy we make involving ourselves is always going to be a weak analogy, but I just want us to think a little bit. You see, again, I, I can almost assure you, you come to my front door, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to give you the money you need if I can. You know, I'm going to take you where you need to go. I'm going to do some things for you, but I'm not going to allow you to become, you know, I'm not going to put you in my will. Which most of you ought to be happy about because probably it's just going to be a bunch of bills. <laughs> Probably I'll start praying for my kids. <laughs> no. Go over to Acts 19. Now, I honestly don't know if there are any Jones on my street or not. So, <laughs> so if you happen to find out there are, don't go bugging them, okay? Don't go saying, Pastor Mike said I needed to come over here and, you know, get a handout or something. Trick or treat. Here I am. All right, look at Acts 19, verses 13 to 16. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul knows, says Paul preaches, but whom Paul knows, right? Paul knows a Jesus, and we're going to try to use the Jesus he knows to get something done, Not the Jesus we know, because the Jesus we know basically is just a historical Jesus who who just recently we realized was crucified and now they declare was raised from the dead. And they're going about doing these things to kind of give evidence to that. But we don't really know him. But we're going to call upon the name of a Jesus that we really don't know. We're going to use this word. Now, obviously, it wasn't the English word, you know, but what but we're going to use this word, Greek, Aramaic, whatever they spoke at that moment. Okay, Hebrew, whatever. But anyway. We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man, and now I'm not in any way trying to liken God's response to you to the response of these evil spirits. I'm just trying to get you to realize that there is a, uh, that there is a message here about our understanding of the him whom we are to have been surnamed by and are to to, uh, permit ourselves to be surnamed by. See what I'm saying? So then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Wow, bad news, right? So here's the thing. Let's put this in some terminology most of us have at least been familiar with. Father. Boy, we love that name Father now. And boy, that's a much better name than God, right? Isn't it better to be associated with a Father than a God, right? Okay, now, our Father is God, and our God is our Father. No question about it. But here's the thing. So we've become more familiar with Father since we left the assemblies of God or the Southern Baptist or wherever it was we were. Where we were most, I mean, I was a God man all my life. Really and truly. I mean, yeah, I used the term father when I prayed, you know, my heavenly father. Please forget what I did yesterday. Please don't let the heavens open up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I I, I use the term father, but here's the thing. Father, 
who tests me, Father who punishes me, Father who rewards me according to my works. Father who is a hard man to please is not the Father that Jesus revealed, unfolded, and rehearsed before humanity. Is not the Father Jesus was referring to when he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one, right? That's not the Father. And yet that's the Father who has been revealed in the church by many, you know, by the message we've preached. So if you're embracing a Father who, who punishes you, who tests you, who rewards you on the basis of your works, who's a hard man to please, you need, you need to realize that you're calling on an idol, You're calling on a poser, as they would say. You're calling on an imposter. You're not calling on the Father that Jesus revealed, rehearsed, and unfolded. I'm talking about looking deep down here, boys and girls. I'm not talking about the word that comes out of your mouth. Again, we can go right back to a natural analogy here, and it won't be a good one. But many of us had abusive fathers, alcoholic fathers, fathers who rewarded us or who were proud of us only when we got an A or a B or something like that, who never said they were proud of us just because we were their child. I didn't have one like that, thank God. Thank God. And, you know, every time I catch myself telling one of my grandchildren I'm proud of you for something they did, I, I correct it right away and say, I'm proud of you no matter what you do. But I just want you to know I'm, I'm especially proud at this moment for, for your accomplishment for you because I know it makes you feel good. Because, you know, we communicate those kind of things without in, intending to do, in, to do that, right? It's like Caleb has said before, you know, I, I communicated a lot of things uh, to my boys when they were growing up playing baseball, baseball under my tutelage and everything. And when I would say things to them, not intending to hurt them, but only to encourage them, you know, I'd say, you need to do that again. Let's, let's do that again. Let's do that again. Caleb threw his arm out by the time he's out of high school, throw, making fl- play, throws from home plate to second base as a catcher. Because I kept saying, do it again, do it again, do it again. I just wanted it to become so deeply ingrained. But to him, it sounded like I wasn't pleased with what, I, with, with what he was doing. And that wasn't the case at all. So we have to be aware of our words. You know what I'm saying? We have to be aware of the way we respond and, and say things. And I have no idea what in the heck I got off onto that for. But anyway, <laughs> it's important that we understand these things. Okay, That we realize that what comes out of our mouth... It many times has a different meaning to someone else, too. And again, I'm talking about father. Is God your father? You say, my, my, God is my father. And there are people on the street that shudder when you tell them that. You know why? Because they have been introduced or talk, had, 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 they've been exposed to a God who, who, uh, who, who refers to their behaviors, a father who refers to their behaviors as an abomination. This is the same Father who was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, putting away sin once for all by the sacrifice of himself, right? And he's calling your behavior an abomination before him. That just doesn't compute, boys and girls. That does not compute at all. There is something wrong with that kind of a computation, and yet that's the kind of Father that a lot of people are are relating to. And so you say, Father, that don't mean anything. Oh, I know, that's what I was saying. You know, we had, we, we, we've, we've been cruel to our children at times. We've abused them with our words. Maybe we've been a very gracious father. Maybe we've been a very giving, a very involved father, too. So everybody has a different concept if we look on the natural side of things. Isn't that right? So just the word father doesn't get it done. Doesn't get it done. All right. All right, so let's go back to Romans ten fourteen. So I said, who are you calling on? An idol, an imposter, a poser. Back in Romans 10, 14. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Let's do that one first. How shall they call on him in whom they have not been persuaded, in other words? In other words, how can they call on the true him when they've been persuaded of a golden calf? You see that in there? How can they call on him in whom they've not believed? Now him, Paul again, Paul knew the him he had in mind. And so Paul is referring to him. But he's saying, how can they, you know, allow, the, permit themselves to be surnamed by him in whom they have not believed? <clears throat> and then he goes on, he says, how shall they believe in him Um, of whom they have not heard. And sadly, my friends, that just described the vast majority of the body of Christ. 
How much more the world? How much more does that, does that you know, refer to the world that he included in his name? He included all men in his name. He did away with that Adamic name. He gave a new name to humanity in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, a man needs to acknowledge it. I've already said you need to declare your acknowledgement you know, of that surname. You need to make that surname yours in your experience. But it's already been made your surname. Like I said, my son couldn't change who he was related to. He could only change who he acknowledged he was related to. Is that right? <clears throat> so here's the thing. If they've heard of a God of judgment or a God of testing, a God of requirement, a God of endless examination, a God of obligation, if they've heard of, of him, then they haven't heard of him. I want you to know that. You haven't heard of him if that's the God you've heard of. Because he said, how shall they believe in him? How shall they uh, believe in him of whom they have not heard. And then he goes on. Oh, I love this one. How shall they hear without a preacher? Whoa! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Come on, Mike. Give me off my back, man. It was the preacher that introduced most of us to the false God we've been trying to believe in. Isn't that right? Yeah. It was the preacher who taught me to identify and call upon a God... <laughs> I believed wrongly about, so what can I do? Well, I got good news for you. Thank God Paul gave us right here a preacher evaluation standard sheet. So we're going to do some evals on the preachers right here. First of all, verse 15. Because the last line of verse 14. How shall they hear without a preacher? You could almost say, how shall they hear without a liar, you know? A lot of us have had that, Okay. But how shall they preach unless they are sent? That's the first thing we're going to look at. Now, the word sent here is the word apostolo, or let me see how you say it. Um, yeah, apostolo. And it's the word we get apostle from. And we commonly just say with regard to this word that apostle means a sent one. But that is an incomplete communication, and it leaves out the most important concept involved. Thayer says that that word means to be sent or to depart in a state of liberty. To depart in a state of... How can they preach unless they are in a state of liberty? Is what he's saying. So what we've done right now is we have already eliminated the mass of mixture preachers. We've just taken them out of the... Now, again, you know what? Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to focus everybody on me. I don't mean it that way. But you've, you know, remember, Jesus said, take heed what you hear, take heed how you hear it. All right? So I'm just trying to help you clarify. There are lots and lots of good ministries out there. there lots of good ladies and gentlemen all around you and on Facebook and every place else that are speaking good word. Okay? So I'm not trying to draw everybody's attention to me or something like that. Don't get me wrong, but I want you to understand this. So it means to depart or to be sent out in a state of liberty. Woo. So how shall they preach unless they go out in a state of liberty? And it's only in that state that they can, what's he say next? Preach the gospel of peace. Yes. It's only when they are in a state of liberty in their own comprehension and their own understanding that they can preach what he says here, a gospel of peace. Wow, how beautiful are those who preach the gospel of peace. Can't do that. You see, preachers all over the world are preaching from a state of bondage, not a state of liberty. They're not, you know, they've been sent out in liberty by the Lord Jesus. There's no question about it. I'm not doubting their call into the ministry or their call to the gospel. I don't mean that at all. I'm not questioning who, who he sent out. I don't mean that at all. It's not up to me to question but I'm, I am, what I'm declaring here to you is what Paul said here. If they have not gone out, they've been sent out in liberty, but if they haven't embraced it and gone out in liberty, it will be impossible for them to preach the gospel of peace because first and foremost, peace here is a word that means to be made one, to make two one in perfect harmony. So once again, the issue is identity, surname. So you can't go out and preach that. If you are a, 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 under, the, under the law, if you're under a, a spirit of bondage when you go out, you know, if you're set out in bondage rather than liberty, what are you going to do? You're going to keep relating yourself and other people to the law, right? There's no peace in that. There's, and if you're relating you to the law, how can you possibly be one with God, you unrighteous rag, you? All your righteousness is this filthy crap or rags.
That's in a different version. Okay, so that's what it is. <laughs> so the, the gospel of the peace, the gospel of peace then is the good news that God made us one with him. So then, to begin with, the content of the true message has got to declare, has got to declare being one with the Father in the same liberty that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have with one another. Remember, the word liberty or freedom in the New Testament. Now, I know I'm taking this from Thayer's definition, this word liberty. But the word freedom and liberty in the New Testament always means exemption from moral, ceremonial, and mortal liability. You look it up. Don't take my word for that. You say, you mean, I, do, I, can, I can sin if I want to? Well, yeah, stupid. If you want to, you can. But what he's saying is what he has done for you has exempted you from having to do any of those things in order to be in right standing with God. But you can, you know, invalidate the experience of grace in your life by living under the condemnation of your own actions. You can walk according to the flesh if you want to and not experience the freedom that's in your spirit to go ahead. I mean, you, you can run around with guilt all you want. You can run around living under condemnation. It won't be coming from him. It'll be coming from your own heart that condemns you. But God is greater than your heart. Isn't that right? But remember, that's what that word means. And so, that, so as I said, the message has got to declare us being one with the Father in the true liberty of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And then next he says, look at this. Next, we're still talking about it. We're still evaluating our preachers, okay? They must preach glad tidings of good things. Go. Now, remember, these are the things, you know, that uh, define for us the preacher of verse 14. How can they um, hear without a preacher? Because most of us, you know, <clears throat> the preacher thing, that's the thing that gets me every time, right? Okay. All right, now, what we'll have you do is this, uh, this glad tidings and good things. These come from, let's go to Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, oneness, identity, surname, whatever you want there, okay? Who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now, first of all, glad tidings and good things here in Isaiah. Both of these, you look these words up and they're exactly the same word and they both mean fresh and cheerful. Fresh and cheerful. So Isaiah is saying here that the message of the new covenant would be a fresh revelation producing cheerfulness in the hearer. How many times have you sat in a meeting and just felt your heart sink? Because there's no way in the world that you were going to be able to measure up to those words you just heard. You, just, you didn't even have to look clear back to last Monday. All you had to do was look in the car on the way down here today. And your heart sunk. All right? All right. So go go over to Nahum one fifteen. This is the other place that this comes from. But there's something else I want to pick up here. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows for the wicked one. Now look at this one. I like this. This is where I came over here. For the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Now the reason I came here is because you see, I think we can embrace this as part of our preacher evaluation standard as well. How many preachers are still telling you that the wicked one has not been cut off? How many are still giving glory to the devil, have resurrected a dead devil or I mean a, a powerless devil and are saying, you know, the devil's going to eat your lunch and pop your bag? says right there, the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He's utterly cut off. You know what utterly means? It's not something that hangs down under a cow. <laughs> Utterlies. <laughs> utterly cut off. He's utterly cut off. He destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil. He has destroyed the works of the devil. See? He shall no more pass through you. You don't need to talk about the devil unless you're telling somebody not to talk about the devil. Really? Why would we even mention him? He told us there. So we got preachers out there that are telling you to worry about generational curses, about, about the devil. Well, see, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're giving them zeros on their pe preacher evaluation forms, right? Okay, just make sure you got that. Mark it. That's the furthest column to the left. Okay, because we're going 1 to 10 this way, right? Okay, we just have a bunch of zeros right now over there. All right, now, so the message reveals then that God is good, He's made us one with him. He's given us his name and his liberty. 
And he's affluent in resources to all who acknowledge their true surname. But then Isaiah, going back into Romans here, Isaiah sees our reluctance to, you know, to hear this all-inclusive message of liberty and justice for all. You wonder how that got into our Pledge of Allegiance? It got in there because there were some people in there who recognized what Jesus had done. One nation under God, indivisible, all-inclusive, with liberty and justice by Jesus Christ for all. And Paul, or, or, or uh, Isaiah, you know, he, he, he sees our, relux- our reluctance to hear this message of, uh, you know, uh, all-inclusive message. And, and so he says here in verse 16, Lord, who has believed our report? This is too good to believe. This is almost too good to be true. Who's believed it, right? And so verse 17, here's the summation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And for years we thought that meant faith comes by hearing the scriptures read. But if that were the truth, then the body of Christ would be full of faith. And yet Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? See what I'm saying? Faith doesn't come by hearing the scriptures read, per se. Faith comes by understanding what the scriptures reveal about the living word, the word of God. Now, remember I told you before that the apostolic concept, when they used the terminology, the word of God, they were referring to the word who was in the beginning, who was God and was with God, and now now had come and had done a complete work and now was resurrected, a living word, see, and they're speaking always in the context of his finished work. So when they used the terminology, the word of God, they were not referring to the scriptures. They were referring to the eternal son in the context of his finished work and his resurrected life. That's what they always meant when they used the term the Word of God. So faith cometh by hearing that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, literally means before the fall of the the world, okay? That he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that he is the Lord, he has not changed, Say that he died with you in him, he was raised with you in him, and now he has brought resurrection life to mankind, and now he is seated at the right hand of God, having finished the work forever. See, that's, I mean, that's a long way of saying the word of God. But that's what, the, but that's what they understood. You can tell that in their writings. You see that they meant that. We just kind of watered it down until it doesn't mean that anymore, right? <clears throat> so he alone is the truth about God, right? But here's something you haven't gotten a hold of. He alone is the truth about you. He alone is the truth about you. You're not the truth about you. He's the truth about you. Well, you need to say that self to yourself all week long. I am not the truth about me. He is the truth about me. That is such a good statement. I'm glad I came up with it. He is the truth about me. I probably got it from somebody else and just don't remember. I wasn't paying any, I wasn't paying any attention when they said it. Now all of a sudden it came back, right? He alone is the evidence of the nature and the acts and the view and opinion of God. But again, he alone is the true evidence of you. Isn't that awesome? Woo, Jesus is Lord. So let me paraphrase verse 17 here. Faith, which is the persuasion of who God really is, comes alive in the revelation of the love of God for all mankind as revealed in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Hmm. So faith, you know, of substance can only rise and be effective in the belief in God's love for you. Go with me over to Revelation chapter 2 here. We're just about done. Just about means absolutely nothing, but we're just about done. I want to be honest. Got to be a man of integrity. Even my own granddaughters are walking out on me. It's gone too long. Bye, girls. Happy Father's Day, Pop. We're leaving. A little public embarrassment is good for him. Now they'll go out and buy me something nice for Father's Day and bring it by the house. <laughs> Revelation 2, 2 to 5. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. See, we were just doing that. We were just testing apostles, and as they told you, finding them liars. Right? Okay. Good for us. Okay. 
And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. In other words, you're going to step out into an area of darkness. You're going to lose the revelation that you have to him who has will more be given to him who has not even what he has will be taken away. Right? You can never go back, folks. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but you can never go back. Once the revelation has become your revelation, you can never go back. You can never start adjusting it because some apostle of bondage continues to proclaim to you, no, no, you've gone too far. You've gone too far. Now you're including too many people. There is still an us in them. You cannot say, no, you know, you can't go back. Because there's a removal of the lampstand when that happens. The lights go out. Say. And even what you had begins to, you know, begins to be diminished. Anyway, let's go back to this, though, because I want to look at this. So verses 2 and 3 really describe an awesome group of church folks. They, they describe a group of folks that every pastor I've ever known would love to have. In fact, many pastors have preached to try to produce this in their church. Let's read it again. <laughs> I know your works. You cannot bear those who are evil. I wish I had more of those in my church. Those who'd go down and pick it on the cornerstones and get down to the abortion labs and, and do all of that stuff. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. Those are, our, those are our doctrinal police. I love them too. Okay. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Man, I wish people wouldn't get so tired of coming to church. I mean, you know, these, this is a good church. This is a congregation of workers. Isn't that right? I don't know a preacher or the pastor that wouldn't want to have a group of people like that in his church, right? Problem is, they've departed from their first love. Or in other words, they have lost sight of God's love for them. They have departed from God's love for them. And now they're working out of duty, out of obligation in order to please God and to be acceptable to God. That's what Jesus is saying here. You've lost the concept of the first principle. He said, remember, therefore, from, which you, from where you have fallen. Where have they fallen from? Paul says in Galatians 5, you have fallen from grace, you who would be justified by works. Right? You've fallen from grace. Or we can say, no, based on what we've known, they have fallen you know, from the first principle, from the primary truth, from that initiating premise that we've talked about, you know, of the, of the oracles of God. That is what? God is love. They've fallen from that first principle you know, of the oracles of God. What does 1 John 4.19 say? We love him because he first loved. First loved. First loved. Okay, we love him because he first loved. He said, you have fallen from your first love. I was telling somebody this morning, uh, relating to them, the, my, my initial introduction to Marilyn by the Holy Ghost, when the Lord spoke to me as I walked by her going in the doors of a church and said, that's your wife. And I'm going to tell you right now, I can say this with an honest heart, I fell in love with Marilyn that day. It was months before she spoke to me. But because God said, that's your wife, I first loved her. I don't, I don't mean that, you know, I'm just saying I loved her first because God had spoken it in my heart. And he loved you first of his own initiative. He loved you of his, he's your first love. We think about first love, we think about that first girl, that first guy that we went out with in high school or, we went, or junior high, or, you know, when we first, th- you know, when we thought this is really love. You know, we think, we think back to that person, you know what I'm saying? But when he's saying you have left your first love, what he's saying is you've lost sight of the fact that you're, he first loved that he first loved you, and now you're working to try to once again gain his acceptance and his approval and so on and so forth. But no, we love only because he first loved. He's our first love. Say. <clears throat> so he's saying here, remember God's love for you is not about what you do. He says, repent or think differently and do the first works. What are the first works? Back to, back to verses 2 and 3. No, repent and just keep on cleaning the bathrooms. That's a good idea, I think. I'll give you a key on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. <laughs> Here's the first works. He said the first works. What's he referring to? I, I believe he's referring to the... Now, now uh, remember who's writing this. Who's writing... Who, who, who just took that quote from Jesus? We believe it's the Apostle John, don't we? Okay. So let's go over to John chapter 6, and let's see if we can't put two and two together and come up with four here. Okay. Verse 28, then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has 
sent. That you believe in him. Now we've got our him identified for us. Merciful, gracious, and so on and so forth. Out of Exodus, right? Whom he has sent in a spirit of liberty. Sent out in liberty. He said, remember that (laughs) I love you. Remember that I first loved you. Now, with that remembrance, the works that you're to do are the first works. What is that? Believe in him whom he has sent. And you know what happens. Out of that, we know what happens. Things take place that you would have never done, that you would have done begrudgingly at best. I don't know if it's Andre or somebody posted one yesterday that I've seen this before, but somebody put on there, you know, when you fall in love with God, you fall out of love with sin. Well, you know, that that just happens. It's not I'm going to fall out of love with sin so I can fall in love with God, right? When you understand how much God loves you, you forget about the hold that everything else has on you, and it just begins to effortlessly disappear, right? So if you're not fully persuaded of Father's love for you, you're identifying with a false, non-existent God of no resource. But he is affluent in resources to all who consciously bear his surname. Now, if you'll give me just two more minutes, I'm going to read part of this Romans 10 out of, this, out of the Mirror Bible. And I want you to... This is awesome. Faith righteousness announces, I'm going to begin with verse 8. Faith righteousness announces that every definition of distance in time, space, or hostility has been canceled. Faith says the word is near you. It is as close to you as your voice and the conviction of your heart. We publicly announce this message. Now your salvation is realized. Your own words echo God's voice. The unveiling of the masterful act of Jesus forms the words in your mouth, inspired by the conviction in your heart that God indeed raised him from the dead. Heart faith confirms the fact of man's righteousness and ignites the kind of conversation consistent with salvation. Scripture declares that whoever believes in Christ will not be ashamed. Announce it. Nothing distinguishes the Jew from the Greek when it comes to the generosity of God. He responds with equal benevolence to everyone who sees themselves identified in him. I didn't bother reading this until after I'd already prepared the message, then I checked it out. Salvation is to understand that every person's true identity is revealed in Christ. How is it possible to convince people of their identity in him while they do not believe that he represents them? How will they believe if they remain ignorant about who they really are? How will they understand if the good news of their inclusion is not announced? What gives someone the urgency to declare these things? It is recorded in prophetic scripture. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of them leaping with the exciting news of victory because of their eyewitness encounter that they are qualified to run with the gospel of peace and announce the the consequent glad tidings of good things that will benefit everyone. It is hard to imagine that there can yet be a people who struggle to hear and understand the good news, Isaiah says. Lord, who has believed our report. It is clear, then, that faith's source is found in the content of the message heard. The message is Christ. Father, thank you today for your word. Holy Spirit, make this message an experiential, living revelation in the hearts of every one of these precious people both here and with us on the web. Holy Spirit, take what I've bungled with, what I've tripped over, what I've attempted to say, however it's come out, however it's been perceived, turn that into the voice of God, to the, to the, to the heart of God in the lives of each and every one of these precious people. Make it become what they need it to become in their life, what you see that they need it to become in their life, in order for their lives to begin to uh, experience that shameless, graceful existence. I bless these people right now with revelation. Thank you that the lights begin to come on, the lights keep coming on, until they are in the blaze of a stadium of light, standing in the middle of the field with everything blaring down upon them and the evidence that it's you that's shining upon them. We love you, Lord. I love these people. I thank you for the pleasure of ministering to them and among them. In Jesus' name.